pleasure of sitting in the audience uh, for a number of his uh, lectures, most recently when uh, he uh, talked about the Hermes and the Golden Thinking Machine uh, at the Carpenter Center. So, uh, uh, as I say, it's a, it's a great pleasure. Um, one of the things that I find uh, really amazing about the work that um, uh, Alex Onis and his partner, Lian Lefebvre, have done over the years is basically the incredible kind of uh, breadth um, of, uh, of the work, um, uh, which is uh, uh, very impressive, involving social, historical, cultural, and theoretical dimensions of architecture. Their focus, uh, unlike uh, so many of, of contemporary theories, uh, really now re starts with uh, the, the emphasis on the social dimension, but brings it together uh, uh, with uh, so many of our contemporary um, concerns, as well as, in fact, uh, many of these uh, theoretical dimensions uh, that I said. Uh, among the books that, uh, that Alex and, and Leanne have published together are Classical Architecture 1986, Architecture in Europe since 1968, uh, uh, Memory and Invention, which was published in uh, 1992, and of course uh, the uh, wonderful publication that we have here uh, tonight and uh, the cause of the celebration, uh, Architecture in North America since 1960, which uh, Alex and Leanne have published in collaboration with uh, uh, my friend Richard Diamond from the Lawrence uh, Berkeley Labs. Um, in addition to the uh, books that Alex has published with Leanne, he also uh, has published The Shape of Community with Serge Chermayev, which was published in 1971, and Towards a Non-Oppressive Environment, uh, in published in 1972. And as I mentioned, the other book, the novel that he published in 1990, Hermes and the Golden uh, Thinking Machine. Uh, Alexander Zonnes was educated at Yale and taught at uh, Harvard University at the Graduate uh, School of Design uh, between 1967 and 19. Uh, 81, and he's currently Crown Professor of Architectural Theory at the University of Technology of Delft and the Director of Design Knowledge Systems. The title of Professor Zonis's lecture tonight, based on the book, uh, um, is From Populism to Dirty Realism. Would you please join me in welcoming Professor Alexander Zonis. Thank you very, very much for this uh, very warm introduction. And uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, accepting to be a host to this event. Um, unfortunately, uh, my collaborators, or neither of my collaborators are here. Uh, Leanne Lefebvre is not uh, here because she has the flu, and Rick Diamond is in California fighting the budget cuts, uh, about which you know very well, go on in the research institutions in the United States. Uh, so I will try to do by my best uh, by myself. And uh, everything which is wonderful about what I'm going to say is done by them. And probably all the mistakes are done by me. Now, um, I uh, would like to start, first of all, explaining a little bit uh, the nature of this lecture. It is uh, not going to be about the whole book. We are going to be focusing uh, only on one part. Uh, I understand um, we have to finish within certain uh, limits. The last time I was here last year, unfortunately you were not here, uh, the lecture took about two hours and a half. But the previous lecture at RIBA took about two minutes and a half. So I think today it's going to be in between. Uh, I think I should say a couple of things about the relation between this book and, our, and the previous one, which is Architecture in Europe since 1968. Uh, what is interesting about the two books is that they run parallel, almost parallel, but they start at a different moment. One starts in 1968, the other one starts in 1960. And uh, like a good uh, French-style methodologist, I should first of all speak about the rupture, the, uh, the discontinuities in a period, so as to identify what is happening within the period. 
So, uh, looking into, of course, the European architecture, we know very well that 1968 was a moment that the whole Europe exploded, including AEA. And uh, very important things happen culturally, uh, sociologically, but also from the point of view of uh, architecture, very definitive changes occurred. Now, 1968 was very important year, 1969, in the United States also, but architecturally speaking, I don't think it was equally significant. If we look over this area, this period, 1960, the beginning of the 60s, is a much more significant moment. Why? What identifies this beginning of the 1960s? Now, uh, it's interesting uh, to look at the end of the period in the sen as well. In the case of European architecture, we spoke about chaoticism and chaos and the necessity of a new look at architecture considering moral issues as much as technical and uh, uh, critical ones. I think probably my conclusion is going to be the same talking about American architecture, but the beginning is rather different. In the case of American architecture, we start from chaos in the beginning of 1960s, as well as we end with chaos. Now, that's not a fabrication to make an interesting point tonight. It's highly accurate, actually. Uh, looking at the literature of the period, I came across a January, the January issue of Progressive Architecture, this very important American magazine that closed down last week, I don't know if you know that, uh, after decades of history. And uh, the magazine uh, was trying to chart what is going to happen in the 1960s. They had just finished their very famous as I said, up to this year, Progressive Architecture Design Awards. They had given the awards. But then the director of the magazine, Creighton, and his uh, team found very difficult to make a summary of what occurred during that year, and even more difficult to predict what is going to happen. And uh, as they were studying the whole phenomenon of highly differentiated, to some degree disorienting architecture, they came to the idea of the concept of chaos. They said, there is chaos, but this chaos we have to recognize is very exciting. A new era in architecture is going to happen, which we can call it chaoticism. Now, chaoticism today, if you read uh, Peter Eisenman and people like that, will refer to chaos theory and physics and try to rationalize that with a very large fra theoretical framework from science as well as uh, culture. Well, exactly the same thing happened in this issue of progressive architecture. Uh, of course, they didn't mention the physicist of our time, but they mentioned Norbert Wiener, and the people around him, and the whole idea that life is something very unpredictable. It is absolutely impossible to chart it or to structure it. This is how they understood Wiener, actually. And uh, the phenomenon, the realization of this beginning of a new era is so important that they decided to do another thing which is very much like things we do today. They decided to have a seminar, but what seminar? A virtual seminar. So they didn't use, of course, email, they didn't use the fax, but they used the telephone. And very quickly they put together they thought they were going to put one article. Actually, they put three articles out of that. And if you read it, it is fascinating because the who is who of America, both in architectural practice and in architectural theory, were there voicing an opinion. Very briefly, I will say that was the occasion that Mies said 
who was against chaoticism, that it is not necessary or possible to invent a new architecture every Monday morning. Soriano, a less well-known but fascinating architect from the East Coast said, from the West Coast said, our vision is befogged, and I'm saying that because it was followed immediately by Philip Johnson, who was very positive, of course, about the whole thing, who said, I have a better term, we should call it foggy chaos. Now, other people, of course, like uh, Buckminster Fuller, were oblivious about the whole thing. Fuller said, you haven't realized this is a world of change. You are worried or you're enthusiastic. I'm absolutely calm because I am the young man of change and uh, I continue charting my way without bothering uh, about the kind of formulations you want to make. Kahn made a very interesting remark. He said, actually, this is a moment of crisis, but what we should be concerned more is not architecture as such, but the redefinition of our institutions. And I think I will come back to this point a little bit later. Now, I think we should um, uh, try to identify what they were referring to. And uh, let me start with something which is the background. I think we need a little, yeah. Now, the 1950s is a period dominated very much, 1948 to almost the end of the 50s, by almost one figure. And this is Mies van der Rohe. And if it is not the architecture itself of Mies van der Rohe, it is his fundamental ideas that the problems of architecture are rather simple if we are bold and rigorous about it. And they can be solved by two things fundamentally. One is the idea of the universal space. That is, everything today can be submerged inside this total environment, inside this box, which is a glass box. And uh, as you can see here, I'm showing you actually sketches by Mies from the 1940s, where he brought the notion of the universal space to the United States. And uh, he, I will come back again to this project, he tried to design, of all things, a motel. So even a motel is just a glass box. And if there are architectural problems, they are of the type, and here you have, from the same building, a very typical kind of preoccupation of Greece, we should be preoccupied with the nature of structure, the grammar of structure, thus, you know, less is more and all that. And particularly, what you see here is already the sketch of the Seagram, the famous corner of the Seagram building. It is different, of course, here, but already the concept in um, uh, 1943 was there. Now that's a very different situation. Uh, those are people from uh, TAC Associates. In one case, looking over this wonderful historical, traditional architecture in O, in Gropius, the man with the hat. And in the other case, looking a little bit more confused about what has to be done. Now, of course, the universal space solved everything. And of course, the problem of architecture is only structure. But there was an idea that there was something lacking. We, out of those two things, we don't have enough culture. And uh, we really have a problem to relate to the rest of the world, which is a world which might not be as rich as America from the point of view of money and technology, but it is extremely rich, extremely complex from the point of view of culture. So two ideas come up. And the ideas are, first, 
that architecture has to become again monumental. So the box is here, but we have to monumentalize it. And the second notion, without refusing the box, is we must somehow fit into some kind of context. Thus, the term, in one case, the new monumentality, in the other case, the new regionalism. Now, behind all that, the major confrontation was not actually inside the United States, was outside the United States, was the way through which the image of America was received by the world, and practically that was the moment when the big American multinational corporations started being implanted around the world, the Hilton hotels were built around the world, and last but not least, you have an extremely important program for embassies to be built around the world, including the embassy in uh, London. Now the problem is, how are we going to fit inside this world, this program of the universal space, the universal class box? Well, you will see very quickly the answer. Both uh, projects come from TAC Associates. Uh, this is Baghdad. The other one is Athens. And what you can see here, if you can abstract this a little bit busy geometry, a little bit historicizing, what you see in the end is this basic idea, the box. And the box which is humanized, civilized, historicized by making a little bit more elaborate the geometry of the structure. And uh, now what you have here, which is very interesting, is on one hand you have a cartoon of the kind of architecture which was developing by the end of the 50s. And this comes for, again from progressive architecture, from a very critical article by Mumford about the situation under the title, What is Happening to Modern Architecture? And on the left, you have this a very bad slide from a photocopy because the original of the magazine was stolen. So they have put now the photocopy inside. It is the illustration of the magazine, of the issue I mentioned before, on chaoticism uh, of progressive architecture. So that's, in both cases, we have a kind of cartoon um, demonstration of what they meant about the situation end of the 50s, an architecture which was, on one hand, very exhibitionist, very expressionist, one might say. On the other hand, an architecture which is rather repetitive, dull, sclerotic, to use the term of Louis Mumford. Now, here you have two extreme cases of very elegant expression of what I'm discussing. Um, on uh, your uh, 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 right, uh, you see the inside of uh, Philip, Johns uh, Philip Johnson guest house, where, you know, the box is um, translated in this calligraphic way. And on the left, much more daring, you see the uh, column by uh, Paul Rudolph, a very uh, early work at Yale of Paul Rudolph, uh, the forestry department, where imagine the rest of the building, it's a real Messian glass box, but the column, as you can see, has uh, become monumental. Uh, it has become cultured, humanistic. Well, in the end, it has become calligraphic. Uh, more challenging is, of course, what Sarinen is trying to do with the same idea. We are already in the 60s here. Uh, I must confess that the basic concept is taken by, from a little sketch by Mendelssohn, done several uh, decades before. But even if the idea is Mendelssohn, the uh, whole uh, implementation, let's say, of the idea by uh, Sarinen is, um, you know, wonderfully done, but in the end, what do we see? We see, again, in this 
respect, because I will refer to the building from another point of view, uh, it's a very creative building, it is fundamentally a glass box with those um, exostrophic, exhibitionistic gymnastics of the structure. Now we come to a point of a big rupture. Chaoticism actually never happened. And it was a recognition of something that occurred in the 1950s. Uh, the mood a year after is absolutely different in the magazines, in the public discussions, and uh, very much in the heads of the architects. I must confess that this is partially historical and partially autobiographic because as a student at that moment, I was very much involved with those developments. Well, what has occurred to change the whole orientation? What has happened? Well, we have a major political change, without doubt. Kennedy has taken over. But very quickly, I have to rush to say that what I'm trying to define now is not the result of a political party or a result of a personality. It is something much more complex. And it's more complex because if you, again, look at the magazines, the architectural magazines, end of uh, the fifth, 1959, talking about the elections, they analyze from the architectural point of view the politics of the two parties and they come to the conclusion they are exactly equivalent. There is no difference between Republicans and uh, uh, Democrats in terms of how they view uh, architecture. So there is something different. There is, in fact, a rupture epistemologique in terms not of the explicit program of the Democrats that take over under the general title, The New Frontier, but it is the fact that a generation, there is a generation change, and there is, of course, quite a lot of uh, change in the personalities in the bureaucracies, and those people view the world with a very different way. Now, the way they view the world and the result of this mentality, we might call them, we might call it, what they result in American Renaissance. Now that's quite, that's quite an ambitious and daring term. Very quickly I will say that it has been done before. It is a term that has been applied in other moments of American culture, including the famous Renaissance of Harlem. But uh, the person who has written, who has introduced the term, and who has written very extensively about it, uh, is the Harvard professor, Matthewson, referring to the culture of the middle of, 19, um, of, of the 18th century. Uh, excuse me, the 19th century, 1850-1855. Now, very briefly, what is Renaissance? Renaissance is a very short period of time where things are rethought intensely, where minds, actions, talk are very risky, very experimental, and they have a tremendous impact for years to come, even if these ideas are rejected immediately after. And this is precisely what happened in the American Renaissance of the middle of the 19th century. Let me remind you very fast. We have in almost five years period the writing of the representative man, the Scarlet Letter, the House of the Seven Gables, Moby Dick, Pierre, Walden, Leaves of Grass, and just a little, bit, a little bit before that, the founding of the dial. From the contemporary point of view, almost every issue, including gender, feminism, racial aspects, necessity of redefining the economic system, necessity of redefining values in culture and so on was discussed 
during this period. The names which we have to keep in mind are Thoreau, Margaret Fuller, Melville, Greenow, Hawthorne, and certainly Emerson. Now there is a similarity. If you look at the beginning of the 1960s, a period almost of two years, we have Carlson's The Silent Spring, Harrington's The Other America, Mumford's City in History, Shermayev's Community and Privacy, Lynch's Image of the City, Jane Jacobs' Death and Life of Great American Cities, Venturi's Complexity and Contradiction. <coughs> so you have this cluster of extremely important, extremely influential books that explode at that moment, and almost the same time you have a number of projects, and this is what I will try to discuss uh, immediately and show here. So we have the ideas, we have the books, we have the people, and we have the buildings. And we have the issues. Now what is important about the first part of the 1960s, and the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the lecture I have to say is going to focus mainly on that, is the similarity, not only in terms of mood, but also in terms of issues between the American Renaissance of the mid-19th uh, of the mid 19th century and the American Renaissance of the beginning of the 1960s. The issues are technology, community, environment, dissent. And they are all clustered and interrelated. So actually, what the Kennedy people did, and architecture follows that, is bringing back this very strong American tradition, which we might name it under you know, terms related to the first American Renaissance, organic thinking, organic architecture, functionalism, functionalist architecture, but this, is, this has very little to do with functionalism in the sense of the 1920s and the no exactly kite, and uh, extremely uh, important terms, more philosophical terms, are transcendentalism and uh, what follows it, pragmatism. Now we'll come to those issues, I hope in the end, because there is a tremendous misunderstanding about, and a very bad reputation about most of the terms I have mentioned now, especially, of course, pragmatism and functionalism. So I, I think it is time to go to the projects and move a little bit with the projects. Here we have an, um, a very interesting building, so different from whatever I have shown you before. It is Edward Barnes. It is an experimental art school in Maine. And you can see very quickly the issues I referred before. Technology, of course, immediately you will say, well, what technology? Well, that is what we have to understand. That technology in the sense of the mid-19th century American Renaissance does not mean necessarily technocracy and technophilia. It is the idea of using human inventiveness and the capability of men to create artifacts intelligently and morally founded. What does that mean? It means that the technology is appropriate to the place in terms of those who produce it and in terms of the way it is going to be consumed. That is, it is not disruptive because of economic necessities, the existing community, and it is not disruptive the existing environment. Now, all those issues sound extremely contemporary. It is as if they come out of a newspaper of the 1990s. In fact, including 
the ecological idea, all these ideas we find them in the authors I mentioned before, and all these ideas are, can be found in the projects which uh, follow, and especially in this fascinating uh, project of Barnes. We might also use, I think very appropriately, this very explicit uh, way of fitting into the environment, of appropriating the, tec the technological means which come from the area and they can be absorbed in the area without disrupting it, we can identify uh, all these issues as a kind of regionalism, but it is a different regionalism from what we have just seen before. It is different, first, because, as I mentioned before, it is not superficial, it is not simply from the outside picking up elements of the region, and much more deeply, it is open to any kind of change. You, as you can see, there is no style imposed on this cliff. There is a totally open kind of uh, architecture, whereby region, among other things, means ecology and community. Now, there is another aspect, of course, about community, and I cannot go in greater detail here. The fact that the whole building is not a universal space. It is an aggregate of units, an aggregate of places which are positioned on the top of a network to accommodate, to support interaction contact, meeting of the people between each other. Now, what is very interesting is uh, the point here. Uh, we can immediately ask how original this building is from the point of view of what is happening at that moment around the world. And I have to rush to that because when we uh, had a presentation just a few months ago in, in the States, where there is a, an extremely critical approach to everything American, uh, the first thing which immediately people reacted is that actually uh, this is an overemphasis on the American dimension. And very quickly, I would say that it is very American with some aspects where, as a historian, one has to accept there are interactions, it's not a closed group of people that I'm showing here, there are interactions with the rest of the world, and especially at that moment with England, and I won't refer to that, but I will refer to Italy, as a very important person, Ernesto Rogers, and his whole effort to redefine modern architecture with the key word be continuity. Community continuity, environmental continuity, technological continuity, and also, and that's the famous notion of the Italians, for everything to change, everything has to be the same. That is, dissent, yes, but this dissent has to take place in an adversary dialogue, but still a dialogue. Now, we know that Ed Barnes went to Italy, and uh, he has, he met Ernesto Rogers. So to end with this story, certainly there are elements of European influence inside this architecture that we are discussing, but the originality and the obsession with which those people got together and created the projects I will be showing is, I think, quite unique. <laughs> Uh, a very similar project follows a year after is Charles Moore with his associates, the Sea Ranch, where very similar ideas about appropriateness of technology, highly industrialized as a process, but that doesn't mean highly confrontational to the environment, or simply I mean, the raising 
which were used to insulate these pieces of wood were imported. They were not Californian. However, the rest of the material which was produced in California was used um, in the specific project. Then other aspects, uh, such as uh, community, are fundamental to shape this highly differentiated um, object, so away with a universal space, and certainly the way the roofs and the massing is organized is made to control the environment by good orientation and good relationship to the local winds and uh, not disturbing and distracting and cutting the continuity of the ecology of the landscape. Um, I would even call this project by Myron Goldsmith, the Robert McMath Arizona Observatory, also a critical regionalist building in this respect. The technology here is important because the problem to be solved could not be satisfied, could not be helped by local materials. So in this case, you do it. But the intervention of the object in the landscape is minimal. You interfere as much as it is necessary to put together and make function this absolutely incredible, unique uh, instrument, the observatory. Another aspect which is fascinating uh, here, which is very similar to the previous objects I showed, is that contrary to this exhibitionism of the structure and this emptiness of the rhetoric of the structure, what you have in all those projects is the idea of scheme. So whether the buildings are made out of wood or this incredible colossus, it's actually an, an enormous uh, building, made out of uh, metallic uh, material, in both cases you have this extremely quiet, extremely serene, uh, one must say, surface uh, through which there is an envelope uh, created and uh, there is no attempt to exhibit or to prove that the object is cultural. But, continuing the same thing, now we come to another concern about technology. A concern about technology, which, I'm sorry, this is upside down, but it doesn't make much difference. A concern about technology, which is neither with structure nor with skin. What you have here are two early uh, drawings by uh, Kahn, early in relation to the problem I'm describing, which is the problem of how do we contain technology in order, and now comes community and environment, to protect community and to protect the environment. Now that requires a new topology. So the architectural building is a new invention, has to be developed according to a different, fundamentally different vocabulary. And the vocabulary is the served, which is community, and the serviced, which is technology. And out of this new topology, then nature and ecology can relate to the building in a non-disruptive way. Now, the early ideas were rather naive. Here you have a hollow, tries to create, um, um, inspired by Buckminster Fuller, he tries to create this kind of hollow, huge column, and inside that puts the piping system of the building. In the other case, he experiments, that's the Richards Laboratory, with stacking pipes, one on the top of the other, to uh, still try to find an expressive way of 
creating this new topology. As you will see, things are becoming much simpler, much bold here. What you have it is the Richards Laboratory um, in uh, Philadelphia Medical Lab. Um, what you have here is a very clear uh, disassociation between the two elements, a new definition of function, a new interpretation of how technology is going to be accommodated, and last but not least, the requirement that a building is a mechanism to sustain community, a chain of places for interaction and association. Now we move to an extremely different project. It's running parallel almost to uh, the other one. This is, of course, Paul Rudolph. And uh, this is the School of Arts and Architecture, New Haven, a building which is made out of, you remember, universal space, one level, one space, 37 levels. But the 37 levels are not simply aggregated because levels have to be changed, but because architecture is defined in terms of conditions for bringing people together and conditions through which those places are going to be environmentally accommodating interaction and community. And the fundamental variable for that was light. Now the building failed completely from the most straightforward definition of what we call functionality. The reasons for that were not, <coughs> I believe, the principles or the ideas, but as Pevsner very intelligently said that in the inauguration speech of the building, you know, Rudolf knew that Pevsner was going to be critical, therefore he invited him. So Pevsner said, well, great architecture is made out of famous saying of the Renaissance, two sides, the client and the architect, the female and male. You choose the gender as you want. Now, in this specific case, Paul Rudolph was both, because Grinswold, the president who bankrupted, I must confess, Yale ultimately, but created out of Yale a true museum of architecture, uh, Grinswold gave to Rudolph complete freedom to do whatever he wanted. And uh, the faculty were so much in awe with Rudolf's commission and Rudolf's talent and charm that they were not able to explain to Rudolf which were the programmatic functional requirements of the building. There are many other reasons also of the same type through which we can see that the absence of constraints were in fact responsible for the dysfunctionality of the building rather than the misinterpretation of the constraints. Now I want to come to another aspect of the building. The building, as I mentioned before, is very much defined from within, but it has also all those very interesting aspects at the outside which create immediately an extreme impact, an extreme sense of scale. But more importantly, and you can see it here in this drawing, they are placed there because, and that is the generational aspect, architecture has to be re-urbanized. So contextualism is not a question of the end of the, of the 70s. Contextualism was defined and very rigorously at that moment, I hate to say because I was educated at Yale, it was defined at Yale, it was questioned at Yale and it was redefined in various ways as you will see very quickly, one of them being the idea of relating the tissue of the building to the outside 
and generating out of it a correspondence of parts. Now, those are two other projects from New Haven. This is an architect, I don't know, everybody, it, uh, I know AA is a genius and they know history of architecture very well. I don't know how many people know Peter Millar. Now, Peter Millar disappeared strangely in the background very soon after he finished those two very important buildings. There are two fire stations and uh, the uh, notion is that out of those two public buildings, a gate to New Haven is going to be defined. Why? Again, problems of identity, community, use of a technological device, a technological <coughs> building to do that, and through that, a way of confining, uh, one might even use a better term, circumscribing the urban sprawl in a way. Of course, the means are very simple in relation to how we view architecture today. Well, what were the means? Something you do not see here, and this is because I, in the end, I ran out of any photographs of that building. Uh, and you don't see the most important thing. It is a building which is made out of a skin. The skin is picking up the theme of the wooden structures of the surrounding buildings. Now, this is 1960 when this building is designed. It's built a little bit later. And uh, the divisions of the building are very much defined in concordance to the rest of the residential buildings. Here, what we have is something um, quite different. The whole building is worked out with axis, and uh, with the axis, the building is anchoring the place to the environment. Now, the idea is the following. The environment, actually, if you visit it today, it's almost the same condition as it was at that time, is a very anonymous, very, very low profile environment without identity. Now, the building is corresponding to the environment, not to blend, but to enhance, to concentrate like a lens the identity of the environment, create an identity of the environment through its tissue. Much more exploratory things also are going on at that time. Here we have diagrams that come from Kevin Lynch, very extreme cases of how the city and the environment is going to develop. In one case, we have the traditional core. In the other case, we have various ideas of dispersal. And the other slides, which I cut, uh, eliminated tonight, where you can see more and more chaotic and much more uh, 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 complicated arrangements, but what I'm trying to say is that another notion is that the building is conceived as a piece to a new kind of environment which is going to develop. So it is not again just responding, but it is trying to project out of the building now the future of the city. What kind of city? Well, first notion I would like to bring out is that the city has to be multi-level. So again, against the flatness and uh, this uh, oversimplification of the universal space, you have the levels. But now the levels, here is a Kalman building, an ex-professor actually at AEA, and a student, I think. Yes, a graduate from here. And this is, of course, Marcel Brogier. In both cases, what you see, and with different degrees of success, of course, is the importance of section, and the importance of section in terms of an overall definition of the city, which is going to be sectioned, and which is going to create a different kind of tissue, a multi-level, multi-functional complex tissue. 
And uh, another experiment, even more extreme, is now the following idea. The idea of developing a building which is extremely compact and part of nature. Now that's very banal, but we are 1990s. I'm talking about the 1960s, early 1960s. The atrium is introduced, is invented. In the other case, you have exactly the opposite. You have a building, some people will call it deconstructive, that's nonsense, of course. It's a building which is completely disassociated, so it can be integrated with the environment because of this extreme disassociation and flexibility of its components. In one case, you have Roach, and this is the Ford Foundation building. In the other case, is the Mummers Theatre uh, by Joe Johansen. Now, let's run a little bit faster to see the inside. Now, the inside is a response to the suburbanization of labor, which already is happening at that moment, and also a redefinition about what kind of environment is the environment not anymore of the blue color worker, but of a highly creative, cognitive information processor, or something like that, that Reich actually uh, tried to define in his uh, latest book. The new kind of uh, person who is going to work in his mind as an individual and as a group. And in this case, the answer, according to Roach, is could go through various details about even the dimensioning of the offices, but the more fundamental is the enclosure of part of the public space, a space which is partially private, but it is also, it continues to be public, and it has perfect environmental uh, conditions to be able to sustain a uh, community. Of course, the building has been uh, copied and paraphrased and deformed so many times that it is very difficult with fresh eyes to look at it. Now, finally, I will come in this whole discussion about the urbanization to the problem of the automobile and the problem of many types of uh, transportation through which we are going to reinterpret building and city. Uh, very quickly, this is back to the Dallas terminal uh, by Sarinen. And the notion is that you cut the building by half, accommodating the other half in terms of those mobile offices, this is how it was conceived, that process information as people go towards the airplanes. Now, what's interesting is not the solution about this building specifically, but as the thinking emerges at that moment, that, and of course, AEA is very much part of that, that the building has to be redefined in terms of immobile components and in terms of mobile components. And out of that, you are going to have a redefinition of the city. But what is interesting about this project, I believe, is that it is very banal versus Archigram, which was so imaginative and so extreme. It is very banal in a positive sense, that it was built, it functioned, and it was something through which you could make experiments. And they found out that, in fact, this is a solution. You shouldn't follow it in airports. Now, in the other case, you have Rudolf's effort to develop a gate to the city and introduce the automobile all the way to the heart of the shopping center, but develop a kind of architecture which was going to solve problems of scale and also problems of um, uh, neighborhood between the pedestrian part and the automobile part. The other experiments about the individual unit, the house, uh, experiments related to continuing, uh, this is Mariotis, uh, to continue the suburban house or redefining the urban house. This is Sir Chermayev's 
private house in New Haven, produced among other things through the computer. It was the first almost computer made uh, solution. Uh, both of them in very different ways uh, revealing um, not only the creativity of uh, the moment but the repetition of those themes I mentioned before and I can go again through the list of community that is the definition of the house as an aggregation of meeting places rather than a, um, a, uh, a, a place which is defined uh, pictorially or a place which is defined by comfort only and so on. Uh, I would like to rush to a few uh, more uh, uh, large-scale projects. Here we have Afflex, uh, Bonadventure multifunctional building uh, in Montreal. Uh, again, what you see here is the combination of many systems of transportation, starting from the train to the subway, the, certainly the automobile, the pedestrian, then the continuous grading from commercial, one might say social or community, which are assembly places, movie houses, workplace, and finally a hotel. A hotel uh, designed uh, in association uh, with a landscape architect, Sasaki. So you have a garden on the top of the building. And again, what is very interesting is not that it is hotel, but that it is residential. So the concept was that actually we should rethink the residential uh, aspect uh, of uh, the building and the city in a new way, in this sectional, multifunctional way. A different, very different view is, of course, Buckminster Fuller, who tries to put everything together, everything in uh, one universal space, and I want to point out again the importance of movement systems. You have the public movement system, the monorail, that links you all the way to the subway, it links you all the way to the train and the airport, all the way to the building where you have a system of escalators and finally the pedestrian uh, system. Now that was a uh, a, a building that the United States uh, decided to uh, build the moment of a major urban crisis and a major international uh, political crisis. It was conceived, it was put together uh, in the beginning, in the end of, it was built in the end of the 1960s it was conceived in the end of the period we are discussing, 1964-1965. Uh, the inside was designed by Cambridge 7, and what is very characteristic of it, in one case you have this uh, you know, public transit system that penetrates this city building, in the other case you have this design which does not recognize what is wall and what is platform, but it explodes and fuses everything together from an object to an architectural convenience component to a work of art to a memorabilia from the space program. A very different project just across actually, uh, the Buckminster Fuller, is an answer, a different answer to our buildings and cities. So instead of putting everything in this universal bubble, the project, and this is just a thesis of young Zafti uh, at McGill, who manages to win with his thesis the competition and miraculously gets it built. So the idea here is again an architecture which is highly experimental <coughs> technologically, but technology, and we can go in great detail how inventive and experimental is the whole building, but technology is pushing 
only to the degree that it is necessary. Second, borrowing very much from Louis Kahn, he uses also the same engineer as Louis Kahn, commandant, the idea of developing a system of service and served, a system of circulation, a network uh, system, which is sustaining community, trying to develop the least interfering uh, aspect with the environment and by the sheer packing of all those units which accommodate a very suburban way of having your barbecue outside and enjoying the view and so on are indirectly preserving the environment by arresting the urban sprawl. And I could go on and on about the incredibly inventive aspects of the system. One thing I would like to say, which is very important, that the building has been, and it is still, extremely successful functionally. There has been no case of delinquency. There has been no case of people leaving the building, of not renting it. By now, the whole building has been bought, actually, has been privatized, and it has been sold, actually, at, with great profit for the state, which initially uh, supported the project. <coughs> now, we are touching those issues related to the nature and the landscape, and I will be a little bit briefer, if you permit me, because I'm indeed running out of time. Uh, this is the Auckland Museum by Roach, once more, where Dan Kelly did uh, the landscaping, a new, again, building solution, working with a section, taking the ground and prolonging it over the building. This is the other idea of how we work the building in relation to the landscape that comes from the 60s, but now I have jumped, actually, uh, several uh, years. Eisenmann's Wexner Center, opening up a grid to the existing buildings and the environment and inserting nature inside the building, well, I must confess, it is a solution that comes very much out of the plan of Millard, actually. And in the other case, um, HOK, the uh, Levis uh, Plaza, uh, uh, San Francisco, with the uh, landscaping uh, with this uh, landscaping, which is both a mechanism to sustain community and bring the corporation, this is the famous Blue Jeans Company, together with the city in a dialogue. Um, again, I have to underline that in the case of uh, um, the Levis Plaza, uh, the building is very, very successful and maybe one of the protagonists is the landscape architect uh, who is Harpley. And um, now we go to more complicated ways of treating the building in levels and inserting transportation uh, to the building. This is garden, building, highway all put together. Uh, in one case, I would like to underline on the right uh, the work once more of Harpling. Um, and um, uh, in the other case, uh, we uh, have to uh, uh, give uh, credit to Ericsson uh, with a very minor landscape architect uh, working out a huge uh, stretch of public bureaucratic space and space which under very different circumstances could have been uh, simply either an anonymous functional uh, piece of architecture or simply a work of art without any kind of uh, 
um, accommodation and support for human uh, community. Now, I would like to move, this is very recent again, uh, once more Cayley with Polshek. Uh, this building is under construction. Uh, now, th uh, this is a museum in Connecticut for American Indians. In the other case, again, a school for American Indians by a group of very, very young uh, architects, Patkau uh, Associates. And finally, uh, to close this part of uh, the discussion, I would like to show uh, Khan's uh, Salk Institute in a way uh, a not so successful integration with nature. You know, Khan wanted to put plants, to put trees, and have a garden run through the building. And uh, it was, uh, to me, uh, a rather uh, unfortunate uh, fact that Balagan visited Khan and argued very strongly for this extremely uh, desert-like platform, which is highly sculptural without uh, doubt, but both from the environmental point of view and the community point of view doesn't contribute much. But I have to say one thing now, and this is pure Khan, that every time there is the um, uh, equinox, the vernal equinox, people, all scientists and all personnel of the institute get together, watch the sunset, and then all of a sudden there is <coughs> It's very difficult to say if Khan planned it purposely. There is an alignment of the sun with the direction of the water. And this is for the people who have experienced it an incredible, incredible uh, um, event, which has two aspects. One is, once more, the relationship between the person and the landscape, and second, the relationship between people as they share this very unique ritual given through the architecture. And I would like to uh, end now with housing. I'm ending before the epilogue. There is an epilogue. Uh, with housing. So many times we have associated the 60s with the impossibility of housing in the United States, at least, and the impossibility of architecture and housing, or the impossibility of housing and a house. Now, I will challenge that with an American project, early 1960s, uh, designed by Marquis and Stoller, the brother of the famous photographer, uh, landscape by Harpling, which is still today exactly the condition you see. It has the lowest crime rate of the area. It is absolutely impeccable from any point of view uh, in terms of how the environment microclimatically behaves to the people and how the environment enhances, enhances the community of the people, but I must confess there is a tremendous difference between the two. This is public, but it is actually the Longshoremen's uh, uh, retirement plan that financed it, so it is not public in the sense of the state. This is state, and this is Yamasaki. Now the difference is that this building is very little known, and lots of nonsense has been written about uh, its failure, this building was never finished. The lighting fixtures, the landscaping, everything was uh, cut. Uh, and not because of the architect, but against the complaints of Yamasaki. In the other case, the client from the beginning wanted to have even the smallest fixture of the details finished within the budget and have the 
total work concluded as conceived by the architects. Well, but uh, what has happened? Okay, but I have to go. Okay, very good. But, of course, the story I have been giving you is not altogether uh, correct. The impossibility of doing successful architecture uh, is something that remains as a memory of the early 1960s more than what the early 1960s accomplished. And uh, it's very interesting that there is an architect who somehow foresaw from the very beginning this impossibility, from the beginning of the 60s. And this is Robert Venturi. Now, I will conclude with Robert Venturi by referring to him not as contextualist or postmodernist or historicist or any of those things, but as a true critical architect, very American, you remember, dissent, very ironical, well, please read Thoreau's Walden, it is a great masterpiece of ironic writing, and everything which is made as a point from the critical point of view is made through paradox and complexity. There is a book that just came out actually uh, this month uh, about Thoreau and Walden, precisely expressing precisely what I said here. So coming back to Venturi, what Venturi did in both projects, this is his mother's house and the guild house, it's a housing, is accomplish his job as an architect from the functional point of view, the programmatic point of view, but when the moment came to withdraw and say this is architecture, he stayed to make a statement about architecture. Now, what is characteristic of all the projects I showed before? You might say enthusiasm, optimism, experimentalism. One major thing which is lacking is self-criticism. There is dissent. Those, most of those projects are done by people who are very angry with what happened in the 50s, what is happening around them. But there is a jump to the future without criticism. Now Venturi sticks there and he develops something. He goes back to the 17th century, if not even before that probably 16th century, to mannerism. He has a prix de Rome, so he spends some time on that. And he comes back with an idea of an architecture of our time which refers to the architecture of our time, and as in the case of counter-reformation, being a rather, counter, not a counter-reformation architecture, the case of architecture in the era of counter-reformation, being a very pessimistic architecture, a very critical pessimistic architecture. Now, how this is done? There is something mysterious happening with those. No? Ah, it's getting even wilder. Um, It's quite important to do it properly. Now, I will try to go one step <laughs> forwards. First this, then that. Okay, good. Now, going back to Mies. Uh, you remember I showed you this motel, uh, early 40s. It's very interesting that Mies confronted reality with his purist 
European architecture, modernist architecture, and the reality was the reality of something very dirty and practical, the sign and commercialism. This is the origin of the famous idea of getting the beam out of the building and hanging the roof under it. It's the first time he designs that. And it is done to put the sign. And in the other case, the sign is simply stuck, like in learning from Las Vegas, in front of the building. Now, we confront dirty realism, but we try to beautify it, to inscribe it. Now, the case of Venturi is very different. Much before Frank Gehry, what he does is he picks up those elements, including those very aggressive type of fences from the environment, the openings and so on, and he puts them on the building, a building which is very respectful for its inhabitants. It's almost moving how much, well, Venturi was in love with his mother, who was very old at that time. So he identified very much with how older people live and what necessities they have and so on. It's an extremely moving building from the programmatic point of view, how internally it is resolved as a human environment. However, when it comes to the outside, he does this very strange thing. Now some people said that's the beginning of contextualism. It blends with the environment. Well, as we said before, this idea of blending is actually a 19th century idea. It's very weak. What Venturi does is exactly the opposite. He creates once more a mirror to the environment, but this is a mirror to talk about the condition of architecture, to talk in fact about the condition of culture and our life today, and through this reflection, be critical. So, in fact, it is realism, but it is not realism which is mimetic, it is not realism which is opportunistic, it is critical, dirty realism. Very much, well, I, it's upside down, but uh, you know the building, I suppose. What I will do now very fast is create parallels between two projects, of Venturi and Frangeri, Frangeri's house and Venturi's house, bring out that actually they are doing exactly the same thing, not only ideologically, not only because they both take this critical position, but most importantly, because, and I will come to this notion, the scheme is, that's worse, <laughs> the scheme is the device. Now, by taking the scheme out of the building, it is a way through which we become aware of the act of designing, the arbitrariness of designing as an institution. Ah, okay. And uh, we become confrontational, adversary, critical about the current situation. But what I want to point out is, and I think you can, I th think, I hope at least you agree with me, that even if in one case you have much more geometrical and much more symmetrical building, in the other case you have much more complicated uh, geometry and so on, fundamentally the technique of taking out the skin and through the device of the skin creating a meta architecture that is an architecture which is reflective and critical is carried out first in Venturi and second in Gary. Now I will conclude with a subject which is extremely controversial. Uh, you all know, of course, this building, the National Gallery Extension. I think many wrong things have been written about the building. I don't think the building is historicist, it's very, very anti-historicist, actually. I don't think the building is contextual at all. 
I think the building does something very similar as Frank what Frank Gehry does in um, his uh, uh, museum here, which we use for the cover of, uh, of our book also. And what I will describe is the technique which works fundamentally with the skin of the building, which mirrors reflectively, critically, what is happening around it, and out of that makes us aware of the context, critically, how miserable actually is our life, how meaningless is becoming, and the position of architecture and the responsibility of the architect in relation to that. Now, what you have in both cases is a, this very confusing kind of contour of the building. It is very different, but it's very similar. When we face this rather noble, old-fashioned, old national gallery, the architecture doesn't mimic. It makes a point to pick up this element in reference to a certain high point in the history of our society and culture. When the Frank Gehry faces the most meaningful part of his side, which is the river, the architecture becomes again reflective. It reflects almost the waves and the movement of the water. But as we turn around and uh, the environment becomes more meaningless, well, you know, the Canadian uh, house, which according to Wittgenstein was the most stupid building ever designed, and um, uh, further down the streets, the other uh, buildings, and the same is the story with the Frank Gehry House. So as we move to the other buildings, the architecture becomes less and less, so to speak, noble, till when we come to the back of the building, it becomes almost dumb, mute, and ironic. And uh, here, uh, with uh, all respect for the monument, it is simply a comment about how advertising is becoming a part of our life and how this advertising affects the idea of the sign, the idea of place. Now I come to two even more extreme buildings of our time very moving design by Ingo Fried, the Holocaust Memorial in Washington, and Eric O. Moss, the Paramount Laundry. Here would you have, maybe less elegantly, uh, maybe more uh, uh, aggressively, the notion of reflection and the notion of criticism. So dissent has come to its ultimate point. The adversary function of architecture has come to its extreme. And, uh, well, what did we say in the beginning? We said that dissent is one of the fundamental components of the way Renaissance the new American Renaissance was conceived in the beginning of the 19th century. But dissent was necessary in order, as very clearly both Emerson and later the pragmatist philosophers um, spelled out, dissent was a step to get out of the habituation and the conformity of our life to be able to go to the next step, 
which is experimentation and changing our condition. Without dissent, and very late pragmatist, Dewey makes that very clear in his methodology of thinking, without dissent, it is absolutely impossible to be creative, it is absolutely impossible to break the chains of our cognitive system, of our ideological system. But dissent cut outside of this idea of creativity, dissent cut outside of the component of community, environment, and making artifacts, technology, is almost meaningless. So from this point of view, although I finish with two projects which I think represent the crisis of the end of the 1980s in architecture, from this point of view, I am highly optimistic about what is happening in American architecture and in uh, uh, architecture internationally of the very young generation. I would say philosophically I see a turn or return, if you want, to pragmatism with a reintroduction of the environmental concerns, the environmental consciousness, which was so typical of this generation of the mid-19th century in America. I also see those two purely technical aspects of architecture, the idea of the scheme and the idea of landscape and architecture as being fundamentally one thing, being a key theme of the young architects. So coming to those two images which prove how prophetic actually, again, the early influential, the early 1960s were, because I don't think those projects would have been possible without the work, the critical work of Venturi. So although those are the last images you're going to see, I believe the kind of architecture we are moving today is quite different, but this is the subject of an extremely different lecture. Thank you very much. Um, well, Alex has just sort of set up the scene, obviously, for the next two or three lectures, so he has to come back and, and do these things. And there are drinks upstairs in celebration of the publication, but I'm sure we can't let Alex go without maybe asking at least one or two very brief questions before you all go upstairs to, uh, to share in a drink. Uh, but we'll see. Are there uh, maybe one or two questions now? Um, you talked about Yale. I mean, you mentioned Kahn and Venturi. If you hadn't studied at Yale, would you talk about Philadelphia? Um, As of course, it's <laughs> highly biased, but it's a long discussion because Philadelphia developed because of Yale. There was a crisis at Yale. Khan is obliged to leave. Khan attracts other people, like commandant and so on, around him. So I don't think it is highly biased to say that Yale was, in fact, very, very important. But it's a confrontation with Crane and McHarg and Jogolo and Louis Sauer and all these people that made Philadelphia, right? I also, I think looking back, that the Philadelphia stuff has also stood the test of time better. It's just as architecture is better. Uh, oh, that is a long discussion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is a long discussion. I maybe there, is, there was a hyperbole about Yale, uh, but. Uh, there is a little bit of historical, or quite a lot of historical truth 
Seattle is very important. You see, if, um, I guess that Philadelphia, is. Philadelphia went down, and uh, what kinds of sixties? No, no, no. I'm talking about the the fifties, and then there was a new dean, a new budget, a new president. Kind of brought it, all the others were brought it. So whatever they did was as an antipode to the tone, the tune, which was defined by the enemy. But uh, still, I think this is very artificial. It's also very artificial from the point of view that many of those ideas come in the 50s, but they become visible in the 60s. That's what I mean, David Strain of late yeah, 50s is very important. Khan also yes. thought out his system in the 50s. Yes. There's no doubt about it. But the whole, even politics of the great society and so on, even environmental consciousness is a 50s topic. Yes. But it becomes visible. Starting, and that's one of the impacts of Kennedy, that Kennedy made people start shouting and saying things very, very public. Maybe we could continue this conversation. Do you think upstairs? Yeah, we might be better over a drink. It's something all of that.